Good evening. Welcome to the Mountain Faith uh, Bible study in the middle of the week, and we're glad to have you watching. If you're watching from around the uh, state of Wisconsin, from around the country, we'd love to hear from you. Anyway, we're going to open up in prayer. Let's all stand to our feet here tonight. And if you're at home and you can stand, if it's comfortable enough for you, go ahead and do that. Give God the honor while we pray. Mm -hmm. Father, we thank you and we praise you and we give you honor and glory. And Father, we ask that we have a great Bible study here tonight and that your people get a lot out of it, that your Holy Spirit would protect and seal in these words uh, into the minds and the hearts Amen. of all your people watching live and those that will be watching this later on sometime down the road. And Father, we thank you for that now. And Father, God, I ask that you to anoint Kathy and I to uh, teach your word with power and with joy and with understanding. And Father, God, and that the minds and the hearts of everyone, even glimpsing into this message briefly, would understand it, hear it, and receive it, and it would prosper them greatly. In Jesus' mighty name, and all God's people said, amen. 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 Ushers, if you would, come on forward uh, around the uh, uh, sanctuary here tonight. You're welcome to take your seats. Tonight's a Q&A night, and uh, we were reviewing some of the questions that we'd like to answer for tonight. So I'm just going to go through my review here again, Kathy. And we have quite a few questions that we could answer tonight and we're all uh, ready. Look at this one. This one said uh, questions to Pastor Dave uh, and his beautiful wife. Um, so, I'll take it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Thank you. anyway. Uh, it talks about, uh, he's talking, this is a sensitive issue, and I think... I think well, it really does say that, doesn't it? Yes, it <laughs> really does say that. I, <laughs> I thought wasn't you were ma making that up. <laughs> well, I'm making it up. No, it really does say that in this email. Okay. All right, so there's teaching on uh, women's authority in the church and women teaching in the church, and I think that there's a, a dividing line there. Um, I, I know that I remember the first time I saw a woman teacher and I didn't really know how to comprehend that. So let's go, it's a Bible study, so let's go to the scriptures right now. Let's read uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. Why don't you start in verse 7. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying, as a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Therefore I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modesty, and discreetly, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly garments. All right, so this is, uh, first of all, this part right here is something that isn't probably technically uh, followed any longer. I remember my mother had pearls, but they weren't real pearls. You know, they mm -hmm. were... You know, they were probably back when I was a boy, those pearls were probably three dollars, you know, for a, a necklace of pearls. But, you know, they weren't made out of plastic. I don't sure. know what they were made out of. Mm -hmm. But uh, people adorn themselves with very inexpensive things today. So the the ability to mimic expensive things back then when this was being written, I think, was a very difficult thing to do. And I think uh, it's important for women to look good uh, when they present themselves before the Father, before I think so God. Too. I agree with that. So, in fact, you know, uh, even with people that are greeting on Sunday mornings here, we even have a dress code for the women and the men. Um, uh, for them, to, you know, we have a, a pattern for them to follow because we don't want them in jeans, we don't want them in shorts, you know, with men or women. You know, we want them representing our church well. And to uh, dress well. Um, I think that you can interrupt me anytime you want to, but I think that um, there are churches that believe in that women can't have short hair and uh, they, they are adamant about it and so they teach right. against having short hair. Um, there are also, you know, churches, some of the same churches that teach that women shouldn't have any makeup on at all and should have all of their, all of their skin covered. They're not mm -hmm. allowed to wear uh, short sleeve anything to church. And so how do you feel about that? I feel that, um, you, like he says here, you clothe um, modestly and discreetly. So I would say, like, many skirts are out. Um, so the modest, and, so as long as we're, as long, the spirit of, the, of this, of verse 9, is proper clothing, mm -hmm. not rips and tears in it. That's right, not Modesty old. and discreetly. And, and like in proper clothing, that means, you know, if... If you have something nice to wear, then you should wear it. 
uh, and when I'm talking like uh, like a, if it, whether it's a woman in a pantsuit or a nice pair of dress pants or a, a nice dress, if you have something nice like that, you should wear it. If you can afford that, you should have it because you're this is because you're honoring Yahweh with that. That's right. how I think about it. Of course, I was raised in a, in a time where you did dress up for God. Mm -hmm. Pants weren't they weren't even allowed because women didn't wear pants you know well, your father your pants. father challenged you on on that once he, he, yeah he did he um i wanted to wear pants i wanted to wear blue jeans to church mm -hmm. and um how old were you i was a teenager i was probably a sophomore in okay. high school All right and um maybe even junior but anyway he uh, i i was really i was you know he he was um you could talk to him and, you know, you can have a conversation about it, right? So we were having a conversation about it. And he goes, so let me get this right, okay? You understand this. I'm just going to repeat what you told me. He says, so this is the creator of the universe. And you want to wear jeans when you go to the creator of the universe. And it's only for an hour a week. And you still think you need to wear jeans. He said, you understand who you're seeing here? This He created everything, including you, right? So I'm like... All right, well, well, you put it that way. So, um, but he said, I'll, but I'll tell you what, he said, I'll tell you what, you can wear them to church. On the, um, if, if, and if you do, then I get to choose your outfit for when you go with your friends. <laughs> Deal off. <laughs> but it was a great lesson to learn. I mean, I mean, put it into perspective like that. You're talking about God. You're, you're, you're talking about one hour of, of the day or the week that, and you want to wear your old crummy clothes, you know, because jeans are crummy clothes, right? So, and, and especially when you, when you know you have better. If that's all, all that you have, all you have is jeans in your wardrobe, God knows that. But you think God doesn't know that you got nice clothes too, right? You know, and you don't want you don't feel like wearing them. I mean, my dad did challenge people in his church mm -hmm. um, to, that he knew, like uh, you know, let's say you're a professional, mm -hmm. professional, like whether it's a doctor, lawyer, or whatever, mm -hmm. you wear nice clothes to work, but then you show up in a sweatshirt and jeans to church. He confronts people like that. Mm -hmm. I'm really proud of him. But anyway, I do believe that um, you are to properly clothe yourself and to be modest. You know, we don't we don't uh, we don't need to see a lot of extra flesh out there. Um, there's just some clothing that just isn't proper in church mm -hmm. at all, ever. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you want to be discreet. And then talking about like braided your hair in gold. The whole point is is, is uh, there. Um, I believe is a cultural uh, setting where you're you're bragging about your wealth but you're also making yourself look like you're not a proper woman mm -hmm. and I think the whole issue here is proper modest discreet and I think that's the spirit of what's what he wants to achieve so right. we want to follow the spirit the spirit of the law, not the letter of the law. Right. And, and that's, that's the important thing. This, now, the next verse, it says, by, uh, but, uh, rather by means of good works, as is proper for women, making a claim to godliness. So uh, that, that's understood. Uh, you know, all women should be uh, uh, giving a good name for God through good works. Right. And, Amen. Right. So, but verse 11. A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness, but I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. Right. So um, th this is the question I think that he's getting at, and, right. and we can read some other areas uh, in a moment. But here's the point. Um, we, there's uh, people out there like Joyce Myers, and there's a lot of other women uh, that teach, that have uh, teaching ministries. And the women that are targeting other women as their goal crowd, I think that that's an entirely acceptable. Uh, because you, whether it's personal ministry, it, women have personal ministry with other women. Women have personal blog ministries with other women. Mm -hmm, right. For just for other women. If a man, you know, we have ministry and you know, led by women in our church. Right. Um, we have prayer groups where women are leading that. So 
I, the concept that I think needs to be understood is that a woman shouldn't have the spiritual authority over a man. And I think that that is absolutely important. So for example, uh, I don't want to give away, this is a, a big name ministry. This woman has come forward and said regularly that even though she's the head of her, her ministry, the, her husband, who's not the head of the ministry, is the head of her. So he's subordinate to her because he's an unknown within the ministry. No one hardly ever sees his face. They hear his name. And when she talks about how she treats him at home or used to treat him at home, she's had to repent of that since then. So just because she is leading this gigantic ministry with 500 employees doesn't mean she gets to roll her husband uh, on a regular basis, you know, spiritually or otherwise. And so right. she's made that very clear that she has to find that on a regular basis, that common ground of not of being having a major ministry and him having a minor part in it. I think of um, the Queen of England and uh, what was her, she's still alive. Um, Queen Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth and her husband. Albert. Albert. Um, and uh, that was a big deal with Queen Elizabeth and Albert. He, she was the queen of the country, yet he had no role. And he there, was not a king. He was, he was not, not a king. king. Yeah. And he was not part of the bloodline. And so there were a lot of arguments in that organization. Uh, you know, he wanted he wanted some authority, and there was a there was a long time where she didn't treat him. Uh, she didn't give him the the proper respect as a husband, and eventually she did. Right. And you and I both know that because we've studied that family in depth. How, how does that play out here? I think that. Uh, and it's really difficult to talk about this because there's really several plateaus here that I need to talk about. And that is, first of all, a woman should not have authority uh, and, and authority over a man. Spiritual, I mean. Spiritual. Now, watch this. So you and I are talking earlier today, and you said by the Holy Spirit, you, said, you told me something. It wasn't a big deal. And I recognized right away it was by the Holy Spirit. And so, okay, I said, I, I need to listen to my wife. But it doesn't mean that just because you were giving me spiritual advice that you were lording it over me Come on. or right. controlling me. Right. So the notwithstanding all the ministries that are out there, I think that there are women's ministries that lord it over men and wrongly so. And I, I don't, you know, I'm not going to go and try to correct them. That's not any of my business. But um, I think we need to find the proper balance. You know, there, there were, in Israel, there were prophetesses when there weren't any prophets. Right, right. There were two judges over Israel. One of them was Deborah, Deborah I believe, Deborah. Deborah. And she was a judge over Israel for a long period of time. I don't remember how many years it was. I think it was 20 years or something like that because there was no men that stepped up to the plate. So she was well, a judge. Right, and, and same thing with uh, Esther. You mm -hmm. know, she saved her people. Right. Uh, the same thing with Judith. Mm -hmm. She saved her people. Oh, right. By cutting off uh, uh, Altari's uh, uh, head. Uh, right. Cutting mm -hmm. off, uh, <laughs> cutting off his head. Right. Yeah. And these are all these things we can find not only in the Bible and the Apocrypha, but we can find in Josephus and right. other writings. Right. So I agree with you. This is in the spirit of the law. This isn't like the law where you're saying you know women can't. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, he says, but I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, right. but to remain quiet. And I, I get that. And, you know, it's interesting over the, the centuries and that, you know, there, there are still churches, actually, that um, regardless if you're married or not, the men sit on this side, the women sit on this side. Yeah, and we have churches that are watching tonight that practice that. And we have churches that we, we help that in India that do that. Yeah. Um, and in so, fact, I noticed uh, one of the, our churches in Kenya practice the men and the women on either side, but that's not all churches in Kenya. You know, right. many times the men and the women are mixed in together. Right. Um, Interesting. Okay, so, the, uh, so the, whole, the whole concept is finding proper, um, a, a proper line of complete, uh, of respect towards a man as being a senior spiritual officer in the earth. 
The other, the other thing is, is he said, I don't, I, he said, I, a woman must re, quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. That's, that's a real problem today because a lot of women um, will not receive teaching in submissiveness. In fact, uh, if we read another scripture, I think we can just go to a couple others. Let's go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 1 Corinthians 14. And start reading in verse 34. The women are to keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but are to subject themselves, just as the law also says. If they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is improper for a woman to speak in church. All right, so, but recognize that uh, we also know that he talks about prophetesses in the church and prophets in the church. What happens if a woman is not allowed to speak out what God wants to say? And she's, and she's, so... I, I don't want to be saying that I'm, I'm recommending that you can break God's word because I'm, I'm not saying that. But this is his. He's not saying thus saith the Lord. This is what he practiced in the churches. But look at all the women in the book of Acts uh, that had authority in the churches. Um, uh, Priscilla and uh, 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 Priscilla and Aquila. I think it, Priscilla and, and they Aquila, also supported them and they also supported them and they followed Jesus ministry around. Right. So to say that they don't have any the luxury of teaching in a church is the very dangerous president that I wouldn't want to send. But I also would want to say that I do not think a woman should have spiritual authority as leading a man that I, I would leading a man either in growth I think that immediately he needs, even if he gets saved by a woman, he immediately needs to find a male head somehow, somewhere. Okay. And, and it's a very difficult, that's a very difficult navigation process. So then if that's true, and I, I know it's true, um, then we can't be dogmatic about it. We can't be legalistic about how we enforce uh, how we visually enforce this. We have to allow a lot of latitude uh, for either change or mistakes to be made. Right. But the thing about women being quiet is we had, um, I, I learned this early on in this church, we had a couple women that would actually shut this ministry down in the middle of my preaching. They would stand up and go, oh, I don't agree with that. Then they, right, you know, we got 25 people in the church and they would jump up, oh, pastor, I don't agree with that. Oh, that's not what it says. Or that's not what, you know, that was meant by that scripture. And they would interrupt the service and shut the service down. And it would just, just embarrass me. And of course, I was, you know, a newer pastor at that time. I mean, this is in the first year and a half, mm -hmm. two years of the church. And I, I thought, man, I don't know why they keep coming back because they keep. And then I asked, I asked one not to pop up and interrupt me. So then she would just wave her hand and try to get my attention so that I could. I finally would just stop and go. What is it? And she goes, uh, I disagree with you on that. Well, that's the same thing as her jumping up and interrupting me. So, I mean, I talked to her quite a few times. I said, you can't be doing that in church. Here's the thing. Women are, by nature, a lot more interrupting. If there was a woman up there speaking, she wouldn't have interrupted him. It was her whole, it was her whole position on men. And uh, it, she was... You know, she had been through quite a few husbands, and um, she was anti-man, mm -hmm. and uh, so it was all amount. It was a, it, a, a first of all an area of respect for her, but secondarily, um, there are women that just don't get it when a particular subject is being talked about. And there are differences between men and women. I had an argument with my sister back 20 years ago. She goes, men, women are equal to men. I said, no, they're not. She goes, yes, they are. God says so. We're all made in, in, in his image. I said, we're made in his image, but there's still a difference between men and women. She goes, well, women can do anything that men can do. I said, you mean play basketball? You mean play football? I said, even if he had a woman that was the size of a football player, she probably wouldn't want to play football for too long because her muscle tone is different. 
I said, and I said, intellectually, we're not the same, and emotionally, we're not the same. So how can you say that? Anyway, she's on my side now, but 20 years ago, she wasn't. The, the, the same is, is approaching things happening in the church. Mm -hmm. Women hear things differently than men. So what he's, the Apostle Paul is recommending, don't interrupt the service, and don't walk outside and go, I didn't like that message. He, he talked about... Uh, you know, he talked about obeying your husband for a whole hour. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just don't agree with him at all. And we've had a lot of women go out to our gathering space after a message and just complain about the messages. Mm -hmm. I've only had one or two men, but I can tell you we've had 20 or 30 women come into this church and go right outside within the hearing of other people and say, I didn't like that for all these reasons. And so the Apostle Paul is identifying a, a hang-up that women have is I can complain anywhere I want to. I don't care. And he's saying, no, you can't. You want to complain about the message? Go home and ask your husband. <laughs> what, what did the pastor really mean about that? Okay. And, and hang it on the husband. Now the husband's in trouble if he answers wrong, but not the pastor any longer. So in the end, um, <laughs> just handle each case individually. You're up here teaching with me, but it doesn't mean that you have authority over men. Right. 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 And if push comes to shove, you would say, Dave, it's, it's your pulpit. You know, right. you, you teach. You say it to me privately and publicly. It's your pulpit. What you believe goes. Even right. if, you know, but do I disagree with you for disagreeing with me? And the answer is no. If, you're, if you disagree with me and you happen to be right, then I just learned something. And if you disagree with me and you happen to be wrong, then, <laughs> then you were wrong. <laughs> but, okay. but, I mean, every marriage has... has and, and by the way, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of couple settings now on television. I, I know of a lot of them that are very, very good. And when the man comes on and, and speaks, I, I mean, I'm just going, give it to me. And the woman comes on, going like, oh, when will she be done? She is so boring. And you're going, <laughs> no, I'm getting a lot out of this. I'm thinking, really? What is she saying that's interesting to you? No, she, you, know, you go, no, she's no. I really understand what she's saying. I'm like, nah. But so this environment that you and I have created that is not unique because a lot of a lot of people on, you know, on the Internet and on television do it. I, I think it does. You know, we do hit people differently. Right. You have their anyway. perspectives. Anyway, that was a very difficult one. So you did the hardest first. I did the hardest one first. Right. I believe. OK. All right. Um, oh, this is a good one. Let's do this one. Uh, you want to read it? Yeah, I'll read okay. it. Okay, all right. So just read what's printed on the email there. Not my handwriting. At our Bible study, we discussed praying. Someone brought it up. Is it okay to pray God's will be done when we pray? Because there is a verse in the Bible that says, if it is God's will. The discussion answer was that if it is in the Bible, that is God's word. If, it is, if, it, if it's in the Bible, it is God's will. Then this morning I researched where it says in the Bible about if it's if it be God's will. This is in James four. Right. When reading James four and five, I understand that he is chastising the arrogant. So he's not saying that we need to pray it if it be God's will. What do you think? Uh, I would I would agree with this writer. Now let's go to uh, James chapter four. Let's look at first of all and uh, read and find out where this is coming from, James chapter four, and uh, we can start. Such a great book. Yeah, in fact, um, why don't you, just, just because it's good, start reading verse six of James chapter four. But he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. All right, so uh, James uh, verses 7 and 8 there is really why we close, uh, press into God and he'll press into you. We'll That's see right. you again here next week at the mountain. That's right. So the press into God and press into you it comes directly from, from, there. from verse 8. Yes. Right. Okay, go ahead. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. Do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. 
There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who was able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. Right. So, and then verse 16, go ahead. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it to him, it is sin. All right. So what he's, he, he identifies the problem. He says, first of all, the way you're saying it is you're boasting right. about how great you're going to be and how much money you're going to make and you're going to go to this city and... and uh, he's saying that if the Lord wills, he's not saying if not to pray and he's not saying not to pray that it goes well. He's saying don't boast about some future event that hasn't happened. Um, I, I know of many people that have come to me and over the last 45, 50 years and said, I'm going to go and I'm going to start a business. I had people come to me and say, I'm going to just a lot of different things. And I go, well, um, How's your education? Well, I don't need an education. You're doing it. I can, anything you can do, I can do. You know, just people would lord what they, you know, I've had wealthy men come to me mm -hmm. that didn't have no business experience. They worked in business, but they didn't have the business acronym to be outside of a structured environment. They just, they would never be able to handle a, a, a subordinate employee or they wouldn't be able to handle hiring and firing. They just, but they were wealthy and they look good. They smell good. They, you know, good givers to the church and all that. Well, anything you can do, I can do better. And that's arrogant. It and is. so then they say, I'm going to, I'm going to go and do this. And then it, just the way that they walk out of the room, you know, they're going to fail because I mean, a lot of people don't know this about me, but since I counted back about eight or nine months ago, I don't know if it was for your benefit or someone else's benefit I was talking to, that if, if you count all my paper routes that I started, I mean, that I literally started from scratch, it's three or four different paper routes, if you, the potato sales, the, the grass mowing, the candle company I started when I was uh, 12 years old, the different things, I call it a candle company. I mean, it wasn't, I started 35 companies since I was six, whether they became corporations or just uh, doing business as DBAs. So that's quite a few. And so when come, someone comes and says, you know, I, I can do this better than you. Well, I'm not telling them what I've done, but I'm thinking, okay, um, you're really bragging yourself up. And I saw a lot of these businesses not do so hot. So I knew, you know, the hit and miss of starting a company is out there that a lot of people that go and start a company don't understand. That sometimes these things hit, sometimes these things miss, sometimes you find out, I don't even want to be in this industry. And you know, once you find out, how, you know, you've got to deal with customers. So I would just hear people and they, the arrogance is what's really being called on here. I think we should look at Mark chapter nine. Let's go to Mark chapter nine. Jesus does have a different way of dealing with this. And start reading in uh, start reading in verse 16. Mark 9:16. And he asked them, "What are you discussing with them?" And one of the crowd answered him, "Teacher, I brought you my son, possessed with a spirit which makes him mute." And whenever it seizes him, it slams him to the ground and he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and stiffens out. I told your disciples to cast it out and they could not do it. And he answered them and said, oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. They brought the boy to him and when, when he saw him, immediately the spirit threw him into a convulsion and falling to the ground and he began rolling around and foaming at the mouth. And he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. It has often thrown him into both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. All right. So uh, Jesus is saying all things are possible if you believe. Right. Now, we privately can have a belief system. But James is referring to the people that are that are saying, you know, we're going to. 
you know, we're going to just kill it. You know, we're going to knock it out of the park. We're going to do this and that. And we can pray that we are successful, but to be so arrogant as to not, you know, we don't know, like James says, we don't even know what our next breath is going to be like. Right. We don't know. We don't know anything about the future of our life. And so it's arrogant to say that we're going to do this. I make goals every year. Now, I haven't been as goal happy as I used to be, uh, but I can tell you that I would make, um, I, and I have copies of them hanging in my, my office that are from 2010. I have goals from 2000 hanging up in my office right now. Mm-hmm. I haven't, they're still taped to the walls in places. And so I look at those frequently and I would have like 100 goals. You know, do so much in sales, do so much in business, have so many people join the church, get so many people saved. I mean, I would list all my goals. And in fact, our goals are really part of our prayer journal that Bonnie uses every Friday morning. You know, some people have complained or said, well, I don't want to read that anymore. You know, can we pray about something else? And one man even complained, well, I don't think we ought to be asking God for that because aren't we just telling God that, you know, that, you know, what we want and shouldn't we just let him give us whatever? The father's asking to heal the son. And he said, if you can do anything, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. So what we're we're believing for great things, but we're leaving the door open for a little humanity and a little mistakes on our part and us missing God. And and, and there's the other scripture that that says that we shouldn't be. uh, um, Well, here, we'll we'll just read some. We'll read a a couple more scriptures. So let's go over to. um, Let's go over to Acts chapter 18. Acts 18. Read just verse 21 for me. But taking leave of them and saying, I will return to you again if God wills, he set sail from Ephesus. Ephesus, right. Right. So he's saying, I'll come back to you if God wills it. So he's saying, I'm leaving the door open. I want to come back to you. My faith stand is I'm going to come back to you. But if God wills. Uh, so God's right. in control of my life. And so one is a prayer to God. Another one is a statement that is apart from God, but then brings God in. I'll come back to you if God wills. I'm making a statement. So I say God willing all the time when I'm making declarations of, uh, well, God willing, I, I'd really like to get out to that job site. God willing, I'd really like to get my car paid off. God willing, I'd really like to uh, do this for the church. God willing, I'd really like to send some money to, but God willing. Mm-hmm. And um, so I don't make it as a declaration that it's going to be done because if I make a declaration without involving God, then there's... You know, anything can happen. At least I'm involving God in, this, in the final resting place of if that thing gets done. Right. Let's go over to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, verse 19. But I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills, and I shall find out not the words of those who are arrogant, but their power. All right. So this is, this is he's saying, I'll come to you. And he's talking in the natural, but he said, if the Lord wills, I'm going to give some room here. Let's go over to uh, James chapter 4, start uh, reading in verse 1. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war on your members? You lust and you do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. All right, so you do not have because you do not ask. All right, so we're told to ask. Keep right. reading. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. All right. So here I am. Um, I had a man come to me uh, years ago and said, uh, I'm going to get a Maserati and my second Maserati I'm going to give to you. He said, you can discount it, take it to the bank. You're going to, Pastor, you're going to get a Maserati. I've had uh, other men say, I'm going to walk on water. He said, Jesus walked on water. Jesus said, I can do anything he can do. Then I'm going to walk on water. And my, my point back to that person was, is that for what, for what, for what point and what glory? Well, just prove I can do it. Show other people I can do it. I said, well, then it's for your own personal glory. Right. It's not, and why, don't, why don't you, you know, start praying that you treat your wife better. Why don't we just start with that and we'll move up to walking on water after you. It may be, in fact, a greater thing for you to treat your wife right. 
it might be more, it might be harder for you to treat your wife right than to walk on water. Maybe we could right. start there. So um, uh, the, the whole point is that if you ask to, re, f to meet your own pleasure, to, to spend it on your own motives, I mean, uh, s spend it on, your motives are wrong because you want to spend it on your own pleasures. <laughs> um, so like praying to win the lottery? Yeah, play, praying, uh, I'm praying to win, we've had people tell us that they're praying to win the lottery. Uh, what's the whole point? So while I'm, I'm going to give a lot of it to God, yeah, what's the point of what you're trying to do? You really, I've had people tell me they wanted to get rich by the time they're 30 so they can retire at age 30. Really, God doesn't want you to retire at age 30. That is a wrong motivation. You don't know that's a wrong motivation until you read the Word of God. Right. Now let's go over to Matthew chapter 7 and start reading for me in verse 7. Now remember, Jesus is speaking here. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. All right, so it's not wrong to ask for anything. Right. And this is where the breakdown comes in between people think that, oh, you just want to prosper. Well, yeah, you do too. Mm -hmm. That's why you asked your boss for a raise last week and then you got angry because you didn't get it. Maybe you didn't get it because you didn't pray to God because you don't believe that God can be involved in, in talking to your boss about giving you a raise. Right. Because you're, you're so arrogant about what you think God wants you to have or doesn't want you to have. Well, I just, I just don't think it's, I don't still think it's proper to pray to God for, us, for me to be healed. Then why do you go to the doctor and ask for medicine? If you right. don't think you'll be healed, stay home, stay sick. Right. But it, see, the prosperity and the healing and all this other stuff that, that a large group of Christians now believe you're not supposed to bother God about, they, they'll circumvent God and go to the doctor. They'll wear a mask. They'll get a shot. They'll get a bunch of shots. They'll get all kinds of tests. They'll get, get tests for everything, mm -hmm. but they won't go to God with their issue. And uh, Asa, uh, one of the kings of Israel, he got a disease in his feet, but he called on the doctors, but refused to go to the Lord about it, go to Yahweh about it. And because of that, he died. It took him two years to die with this disease in his feet. And it says in scripture and Josephus that not once did he ever call on Yahweh to heal him. Terrible. Yeah. So that's stupid. And, and so he does not died of a disease that God, it's presumed by the way the scripture is written that he would have been healed if he simply went to God. So Jesus is saying, first of all, ask and it will be given to you. It doesn't say ask and it might be given to you. This is a prayer between you and God. This is not a declaration between you and another person about uh, something great you, you, you claim you want to do. Walking on right. water, that's mean, did you go to God and say that you want to walk on water and just surprise every one day and come out and walk over the swimming pool and pick up, you know, pick up all the toys off the floating, floaties off the swimming pool? I mean, that would be, that certainly would be at least a little bit less pride-filled. At least you're keeping it quiet until the event happens. But again, trying to do that just to show off is uh, pride. It it's is. It's arrogant. Absolutely. So let's keep reading. All right. Or what man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? And then, then people say, well, then, uh, you just want to ask for a Cadillac. I have had people throw that in my face. I don't even like Cadillacs. I said, no, I won't ask for a Cadillac. I'll ask for something I like. And I have some cars out there that I like, both new and old. So I like really old cars, as you well know. I spend a lot of time on the internet looking at cars, you know, built in 1930, mm -hmm. in 1920, 1910. And I also like some new cars that are out there. But, um, but that doesn't mean I can't ask for those. Um, I can ask for anything I want to. We prayed, but we, uh, we prayed for um, quite a long time for our house that we live in now. And when we were praying, we would keep adding things that we wanted in the house, like... Um, uh, for instance, we were living in a uh, little three-bedroom house, and it, it was behind our business. And so all the rooms, so here's the living room, and every room branches off of it because there's no hallways. <laughs> and the bedrooms had to have windows, so they did. But the living room had no windows. It had a skylight, so we'd have light. Anyway, 
we were there for five years and we were praying for our home and we prayed for a lot of specifics. We, uh, windows. We prayed, we for, prayed windows. for over 40 windows. Uh, we prayed for a lot we of windows. We prayed for some really crazy stuff. We prayed for porches. That we could sit on. We prayed for we prayed a for place a we could, we could, where we'd be able to teach the kids. Um, but we, we were specific about yep. the schoolhouse, all right? So I don't want people to misunderstand this. We prayed for a schoolhouse, a separate structure. Go ahead. We prayed for a fireplace. Mm -hmm. uh, so all those things we got. Mm -hmm. you know, had and and it, was, it was a house I thought God didn't want me to have because it was too nice. When we went to see it, I said this, I told you three or four times, this house is way too nice for us. Uh, you know, and then I went and put money down on another house that God didn't tell me to go after. And then God, you know, put me in, in the hot seat for eight hours all night while you slept peacefully. And I had given a $5,000 deposit down on the house. And that was on a Friday afternoon and then all night Saturday night. And then Saturday morning, I called up the real estate agent. I said, the deal's off. God doesn't want me to have that house. He blew up. But he, of course, you know, legally he had to give me my check back because there's a three day period of that. Mm -hmm. And even then, you know, God probably would have sabotaged that somehow because he didn't want me to have it. I drive past that house uh, now probably about once a month and it's a death trap. The, well, the whole house that was being, a death but trap. But that being said, you know, um, God answers prayers. We, we, got so a, we, we, got a house, we got a house with 40 windows. In fact, it has 42. We got a schoolhouse. Uh, we got a fireplace. We got land for our horses and our animals and our kids. In fact, that we had so much land that um, we would have to have a horn and a bell just to call in our kids. They were so far away. Mm -hmm. And um, so, it, yeah, God met all of our, it was in the country. It was, a, it's, we still live there. It's a classic house. Mm -hmm. uh, we were praying for you to get a- um, Bigger vehicle? A, a Suburban. And I was praying that we would get a, a for free. We, I, would, I was praying that we would get a twelve thousand dollar suburban for free. And you were praying, no, Dave, no. I mean, I don't know what you were praying. But anyway, we wasn't praying that. You, yeah, you weren't. You weren't in agreement with me at all. And then we ended up getting a suburban. I wanted a twelve thousand dollar suburban for free. You said, I don't know, you know, that's we really shouldn't be whatever you were saying. And we got us that suburban for six thousand dollars. So God met us halfway. Right. Right. And and to this day you haven't paid me back that six grand. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you owe me some money. And you know, I haven't forgotten it. Yeah, it's funny. <laughs> so, okay. But it's, that's a true story. And it remember, is. I got on your case about it. I said, okay, we got a twelve thousand dollar car for six grand. And I remember just nagging you about that for like a year. Couldn't you have been in agreement with me? So the next vehicle, next Suburban, no kidding. Next Suburban, I said, we're up, gonna upgrade. You remember what happened? And I went down, I, I, I woke up one morning and the Holy Spirit spoke to me right as soon as I woke up and said, today's the day your wife is gonna get that car debt free. And it was a $50,000 Suburban. And it, was just, it wasn't just any Suburban. Do you remember it was an LL? Yukon. It was a Yukon LX. XL. XL, leather, everything. And I didn't even know it existed out there. And so I woke up and then I called my friend down in Madison. I said, I just feel like I'm supposed to come see you today. He owned a, a car dealership. He's a good friend. So I drove down there to see him. But before I drove down there to see him, I checked my account balance and something wasn't right. My personal checking account, there was 50 grand in there. Now, I'm a finance major. I don't misplace $10 around the house. If I wash my jeans, I go looking for the money, you know? So anyway, and then I, I said, that can't be right. So I went and asked for statements from the bank. I said, get me the statements. I'm going to come down there and print it out. This is before you would email statements. So they printed out statements. And I said, can you go back any further than 12 months? They said, no. And I had 50 grand in there. I know I didn't have 50 grand in there. There's no way. No, no. no. I wouldn't even have, I, I would have known if I had $500 in there. So um, I went down there and he's got this vehicle. He just got in. It was, it was a, uh, um, it was a loaner, brand new loaner. And I looked at it, sat in it, and it was like 50,000. And I said, I just had a miracle happen to me. I got 50 grand, I don't even know what to do with it. So I wrote him a check that day. Right. 
I drove, I think I, I drove you down the next day to go pick it up. How, we went down the next day to go pick it up because they had to prep it for us. And we drove it home and I, I double checked their accounts. The money came out, bank never called us and said, you got a $50,000 check here and we made a mistake in your account. We're taking the money back. There's, I know an angel put that money there. I mean, this has happened to us so many times. The same thing happened with, uh, we were praying that we'd have a catalog that we'd be able to put out a catalog for our company. And our company was so tiny, and I just wanted a, 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 to print our own catalog. We were using little, we were using pre-printed catalogs mm -hmm. that was costing us a couple thousand dollars. And I said, Father, I know I can print 35,000 catalogs. Right. Uh, or what, no, I think it was 100,000 catalogs or something like that. So I, I went as far as, the Holy Spirit said, go as far as you can. So I went and had the catalog designed. I designed most of it myself in, in using a lot of catalog wisdom, cataloging, which a lot of people get into and fail at. And then uh, the Holy Spirit said, check your checking account. I said, I don't need to check my checking account. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me the next day, said, check your checking account. You've got money in there that you don't know about. So I said, Holy Spirit, I, I know. And I'm talking to the Holy Spirit. I know I don't have any money there. And the next day, the Holy Spirit speaks to me again. He said, if you don't check your account today, the miracle that you don't know about that's already occurred, you're not going to see tomorrow. And it was, I don't know, it was oppressive word. So I said, oh, okay. <laughs> I went down to the bank. I said, uh, what's in my business checking account? Because this is now my tiny little company. You know, we got like, what, 1.5 employees. And um, you go, how, many, you know, how, how much is in my checking account? And she writes it at 37500 And it was, I had just gotten a quote the previous week to print this 100,000 catalogs, mm -hmm. or whatever it was, 7,500,000 catalogs, and the, and the quote came out to 37500 But I was just doing what the Holy Spirit told me to do, go out and get it, go as far as you can with no money. Right, right. And just believe God. And so I kept on praying over the quote. I said, God, just meet our needs. But when God met my need, I didn't believe it. So I said, that can't be right. And I looked at it. Now, you know how good I am with, I can add up, I can, if you throw 10 numbers at me right now, I can add them up pretty quick in my head. I, we throw, you know, we throw a lot of numbers around during the daytime and I can remember what I released two weeks ago. That stuff stays in my head, it's just the way my brain operates. I don't make mistakes, financial mistakes, mm -hmm. number mistakes. So I said, that can't be right. <laughs> So, no, you've had that money there, it looks like for a year. It happened again. <laughs> so, give me my statements. Sure enough, 35 grand, 37, uh, five was there. I wrote out a check, paid for the printing in advance, and we did our first personal catalog with, and that was designed by, you know, moi. And it was a miracle. It was. And we've had so many miracles occur like that. We have. You know what? And you know what? Just it makes me wonder why I'm not praying for more miracles. I, I, mean, I mean, the church is doing good, but I haven't been praying for miracles like I should be praying. We'll get on it. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling like I'm correcting myself up here, right in front of God and everybody. No, it's okay. okay. Uh, so uh, Jesus is saying, "Ask and it will be given you; seek and you will knock." If you then, verse 11, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your, your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? Amen. So my kids come up and exactly. ask me, my kids come up and ask me, Dad, can we, can we have a popsicle? No. Well, we got 200 of them in, in the basement in a big box. I said, yeah, I know. But you can go look at them. But you can't have a popsicle. I don't do that to my kids. Or then they'll go, well, Dad, can we, can, can we touch them? Well, yeah, you can touch them. You can even lick the plastic on them. But as soon as you're done licking the plastic, put them back in the freezer. I don't, you don't do that. You know, in fact, you're worse at about that than I do. Even kids ask for a popsicle. Sure, you know. <laughs> you know, because, you know, popsicles, what, cost us 10 cents a piece back mm -hmm. in that day? Yeah. Right? yeah. yeah. We, we didn't hold back. You think it, it hurts God to give us anything? It does not. You think, nope. he's, you think he's running out of money in heaven? I stay on these scriptures all the time. I, I pray these all the time. And uh, I remember uh, when, that, when we really didn't have money, I remember praying over my gas tank. I had plenty of gas in my tank to get where I had to go and get back. Yeah, you would leave the house with, with $1.67 with no gas, and you said you wanted to go shopping in Madison. 
And then you'd come back and you still had gas in your tank. And get, I knew your tank was empty. And this happened to you repeatedly. Oh, and said, how, how, did they, how did you go to Madison? Are you over and, and, and the, you came back and the tank was still empty, but you came back. You left empty, came back empty, but you traveled. You do that with, you you do that with everything. You do miles. that if your car doesn't sound right. You pray over it. You mm-hmm. know, you pray over everything if you're smart. You know, It'll just because God takes care of it, then it's it's His deal. Mm-hmm. You know, and He'll and He'll take care of it for you. He, he loves to do things for you. Mm-hmm. So I mean, this this is an especially Matthew seven seven's great yeah. scripture. Yeah, in fact, if it's God's will. Uh, you know, we're pu- talking publicly. If it's God's yeah. will, we'll do such and such and such. Yeah. But right. privately, I mean, I, I unload in my prayers. I mean, there's a lot of things I ask for daily. Well, it, it is God's will that you have a happy marriage. It mm-hmm. is God's will that you be healthy. Mm-hmm. It is God's will that you prosper. Mm-hmm. Even as your soul prospers, mm-hmm. you prosper. It, it, it is uh, God's will that you're, you have uh, well-behaved children that do well, mm-hmm. you know. And um, it is God's will that, you know, your children marry very well. Mm-hmm. I mean, that all that is, all those if, good things is God's can, will. If you can, all things are possible for him, right. he believes. So, right. Absolutely. So, I mean, uh, one of the things that Dave and I do is we go camping and... Um, we just had another miracle. We, we don't make reservations. We fly by the seat of our pants and we, get it, we decide, oh, we're going to go north. We're going north. And so um, we were on our way going north a couple weeks ago and God just provides the coolest campgrounds for us. I mean, we just pull in there and it's just like, you got anything? It's like, yep, we do. And they're just beautiful. They're on the water. We, um, we took a, a really nice trip to um, Montana some years ago and we had the best campsites because because camping is a journey too. You know, you go into Montana, that's a long ways away. And so uh, each night that you're setting up camp, we got to be by water. We had um, just secluded campsites. We just had the best campsites ever. And it was just... And everyone God said, well, how did you get this campsite? People would walk past our campsite. We go, just drove to it. Yeah. it just, how, the Holy how, Spirit how, just led us to it. Let's, let's try this one. Mm-hmm. Boom. Mm-hmm. So it's true. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it happens all good. the time. And, and on good. this one, the Holy Spirit directed you to one particular campsite in the middle of a place that we've never been to before. And I heard the Holy Spirit say, "I just told your wife what to do. Just follow her instructions now." As she just we were weaving around in the middle of the country, didn't yep. even know where we're going. Right. And we just ended up there. We did. Yep. So anyway, it's all good. All right. Praise God. Father, we thank you for this uh, teaching here tonight. And Father, I ask that your uh, people would be uh, lifted Amen. up and instructed through it and encouraged. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Father, I ask that you give me a great message for your people on Sunday, both on television and live, and that uh, uh, your people respond with salvations. And we see that uh, salvations and attendance online and in person uh, increasing yes. every single week. Amen. And we thank you for that in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. amen and amen. So this is Pastor Dave and Kathy Gonzalez saying... Pressing to God. And he'll press into you. And we'll see you again here uh, back this Sunday at, at the, the mountain. mountain. Amen.